Hello, everyone. Good morning to you. Hey, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Come on, somebody. It's a rainy day. Is this like summer? Is this supposed to be summer right now? Just... Just go like, it's yes, say yes, it is supposed to be summer right now. But hey, I'm glad you're here today. I just want to take a minute before we do anything else, introduce myself to you. Uh, for those of you who are new, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord today, come on, let's go. You can do better than that, let's go. Come on, you got to loosen up because it's cold outside. So you got to warm up a little bit, that's all right. That's all right. I had to, too. I was asking the dream team before we started up today because um, the dream team all meets real early, and we, we, we work real hard to make sure that everything is, is right and comfortable. And I was asking the dream team a, a quick question. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do uh, in, in the rain? You know, when it's a rainy day, what's your favorite thing to do? And uh, a lot of people said, you know, we got a lot of real upstanding people. So, oh, read a book and uh, read a book and sometimes watch a movie, cuddle up with a blanket. And but does that sound like your day? Because I, I don't know about you, but my 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 rainy days, I, I want lightning to hit something. I don't know, like that's kind of what I like. And another thing I like to do on rainy days is wear super oversized sweaters. I don't know, that's another thing I like to do apparently on rainy days. <laughs> Before we get into the message today, I want to let you know about something going on. We are actually um, going to be launching our life groups in about a month. Uh, come on, let me hear it for life groups because life groups are amazing. Yeah. Life is better together, as we say, and, you know, you'll never experience all that this church has to offer until you get involved in one of our life groups. So what we're doing now, we're getting ready for that. We're allowing you the opportunity to lead or host a group. I don't know if you know this or not, but you can lead a group. It doesn't take a Bible college degree. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to have people over at your house. All we really ask, go through our girl track and go through our little training for, for life group leadership, and, man, you're you're good to go because our life groups are, are really simple in, in nature. You know, we, we want to just have fun and get people together. I've actually been toying. Around. Now, don't hold me to this. I know we're recording this and everything. But um, I was actually thinking about doing like a Frisbee golf group. Would that be something that somebody would come to? I don't now, don't hold me to like you said you were going to do a Frisbee golf. No, I did not. Say, I said I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it because real golf group would be too expensive. Man, I would do that one. Y'all should come with me to that. But, you know, our life groups can be about a lot of things. We've got, we've got real Bible studies going on. Uh, we've got book studies, um, sermon-based studies, um, you know, groups of all different kinds. And so don't let the, the idea like, oh, I'm not, I'm not equipped to teach somebody anything really profound. Don't let that stand in your way. Just go ahead and uh, start talk, just start the conversation up with uh, the folks in the back and They'll talk you through it. They'll let you know uh, what, it, what it takes. And so I, I would encourage everyone here who's considering it to go ahead and lead or host a group. Amen. That's great. Okay. Let's get started for the message today. We're in this series called Frequently Asked Questions. Okay. And actually, uh, this is kind of the way that Jesus did his ministry too. You know, some of the best sermons that we have from Jesus were based on, were based on questions that people posed to him. People would walk up to him and say, Hey, Jesus, should I pay taxes or not? You know, they'd try and challenge him, and then he would come back with, like, these amazing messages. But a lot of them were based on questions that people had. So we figured, hey, you know, at least I ought to try and walk in Jesus' footsteps a little bit. And I know that a lot of people have questions. So we're, we're doing kind of what Jesus did and trying to answer some of the most frequently asked questions of the Bible, of God, and, tr and try and get on the front end of this. So today... Today, today, ooh, ooh, you, you guys who weathered the rain, you are in for a treat today because I want to talk to you about how do I handle stress? How do I handle stress? Show of hands if you dealt with stress this week, just this week, amen to that. I don't know what has been going on with me and these messages. I'm almost about to make Tiffany preach the rest of this whole series because every time I'm getting ready to, to, to talk to you about something, I go through it. I'm like, man, that is enough. I want to talk, talk to you guys about being, like, super blessed, having excess, having, like, wonderful, awesome everything. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you about stress because every single time for this whole series, I've been, like, dealing with this myself. So I'm coming to you from a place of understanding that, hey, stress happens to all of us. We all have to deal with stress. But the good news for us is that God has a lot to say on the matter. There is no shortage of scriptures and ideas and principles that are going to get us through this idea, this concept that in this world, 
will have stress. We will face things that, that are, are going to try and weigh us down. Actually, there's a, I, I borrowed a lot of this material from my good friend and mentor, Chris Hodges. He's like my, my, my mentor from a distance. And Chris Hodges and Church of the Highlands actually came up with a lot of this material. I wanted to share it with you, though, because I feel like stress is one of the, the biggest factors that can tend to take us not just out of our, our relationships, but out of our faith. When we're faced with extreme stress, man, I want you guys to, to know everything you possibly can about this issue. And there's actually something called the Stress Institute. Did you know that? Did you know there's a Stress Institute? They did a study that shows that one in five, one in, that's 20% of you, 20% of you are dealing with what is called extreme stress. Extreme stress is, is defined as physical signs of going through stress. Like you are physically affected by the amount of stress that you're under right now. One in five of you. I, I see some heads going like this. I'm like, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, so I almost wanted to go over some of these, uh, some of these things that we deal with uh, that tend to be stress causers um, and, you know, see if it just resonates with any of y'all like it did with me. Some of the stress could be coming from some of the relationships that we're in. Relationships can cause stress. Oh, yes, they can. Actually, I think it's probably one of the, the biggest things. I'm going to tell you two things today where I think stress comes from and how to deal with that. But since we just deal with difficult people last week, I'm going to just focus on the other two. If you missed that message, go ahead and go back in our Facebook or our YouTube channel and check that out. But relationships is number one. That's where, that's where stress comes from is relationships. Another thing is conflict. Conflict, when you have a conflict with someone at work, when you have a conflict with someone uh, in the family, you know, that's kind of relationship uh, associated, but it's a little different. Uh, some of you are stressed because, you know, I'm married. <laughs> I'm married, and that's the reason why I'm stressed. And some of you are stressed because I'm not married. And that's the reason you're stressed. So some of you are stressed because you're married. Some of you are stressed because you're not married. It's like no matter where you're at, <laughs> you get stressed to deal with. Um, how about deadlines? You know, deadlines, looming deadlines. Those of you in school dealing with deadlines. Those of you at work with looming deadlines and there's pressure on top of you. Um, how about legal problems? Dealing with legal problems or even debt. Um, Divorce. I know some people are, are, are dealing with that, and that causes a lot of stress. Uh, stress can come from getting a new job or, or a new career, but then there's stress that comes from your old job and the career you've had for a long time. So again, the stress can come from every direction. Stress from an illness. Uh, st stress from parenting. Hello. This is the one that Tiffany and I deal with a lot these days with a two- and three-year-old about to be three- and four-year-old. Parenting is stressful. They, I, amen. I wasn't asking for an amen right there, but some of you parents are like, amen. Yeah, preach about that, please. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I could talk to you about that. Um, parenting is <laughs> this causes stress. Um, how about um, expectations from others? When, when others have expectations of you that are ridiculous, right? We can have people that are, are, are having these expectations on us, or we have expectations of others that are unrealistic, and so now we're stressed out because we have these unrealistic expectations of others, and they're not ever going to be able to fill those, and then it goes both ways. So you're stressed out. Um, how about unresolved sin? Some of us have unresolved sin in our life, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand about that. But, hey, you're in church today, so I would just, you know, invite you by the end of this service, man, leave that at the foot of Jesus. Come up at the end of service when we're doing our prayer time and just let someone pray for you about any unresolved sin in your life because it causes stress. It does. When we know there's something in our life that shouldn't be there. You know what I'm saying? Let, let God deal with you today. Um, how about the stress that comes from the San Francisco Giants? Come on, somebody. Boo. -hoo. Man, that's rough. I don't have any stress because I'm a Dodger fan. So, I mean, hashtag Cody Bellinger all day. So, I'm talking to a select group of people now. That's all right. Baseball. Baseball. You're not, you ain't American unless you're into baseball. Unless you're a Dodger fan. Okay, All-American team. God has plenty to say about stress, and so that's good for us. But he didn't say, he didn't, now listen, listen, he didn't say nothing would ever go wrong in our lives. And that's something that we need to recognize. That's something we need to, to realize right away, that, that the Bible that and God and Jesus never said, you're never going to have any problems, everybody. No, in fact, he said this in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome 
the world. He said, you are going to have trouble. He said, I can't guarantee your problems will go away, but I can guarantee there is peace available in the midst of your problem. Now, that's a good place to say amen, that no matter what faces us, no matter what comes against us, no matter what this life has to offer us, we have peace in Jesus Christ. Can I hear one good solid amen there? Ooh, yeah, you guys are all right. I like you. I like that. Psalm 34 says this, many, in fact, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Man, you're righteous. You're doing things right. You're doing all the things you're supposed to be doing. You're at church, but many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, we're going to talk about what that really means as the message goes on, but let me tell you about this word afflictions. Afflictions. Now, this is from the Old Testament. That's, that's a psalm from the Old Testament. That means it was written in Hebrew. And so that means we can elaborate on that, what that word even means, afflictions. What that word, what another meaning of that word is they tie you to a stick and pile rocks up against you until it finally crushes you and you die. That's what that word afflictions mean. Like they're going to pile rocks on you until you slowly, painfully die. And honestly, some of you feel that way. Like if one more thing piles on me, I'm going to die. I am going to literally die if one more rock, one more stress, one more, one more thing comes against my life. I just can't handle it. And that's what that word means. Like it's piling up against you. But the Lord delivers us from that painful death. He delivers us from that painful death. Now I think other than relationships, I think there are two main culprits Two main culprits to, to, de- to, to causing stress, actually, that cause stress in our life on a regular basis. And, I, and I, I think that because from Psalm 62, let's read it. It says, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depends on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Selah. You ever seen that word in the Bible before? Selah. You ever heard somebody say it to you? Selah. It's like they forgot to translate that word or something. But let me tell you what selah means. It means stop. Now think about what we just said. It's like, this is a psalm, right? Like a song. It was written to be like a song. And it was like we're singing up here. Oh, God, there's nobody like you, God, and there will never be. It's like band, keep on playing, but we're going we're gonna to stop saying words. I'm going to let you think about what we just said. There's not going to be any, there's no one like our God. There is no one, Selah means, hey, stop and think about that. Let it settle into your spirit. Let it settle into your bones. Let it settle into your heart, the fact that there is no one like our God. So we just read a bunch of words, and he said, think about it. Hold on, wait, stop. Before you read on, think about that. So when you see that in your Bible, that's, that's what that means. And then he goes on to say this. Now that you stopped and considered all the good stuff that verse had to say, goes on to say, low-born men are but a breath. They come and they go, low-born. Let me just translate that for you. Low, that's all of us. <laughs> we're all normal people. Everyone here, I may be like a little bit taller than you guys right now, but we're all on the same page. We're all low-born. We're all normal, regular people, and we are but a breath. It, we just come and we go. And the highborn are but a lie. What that's, what's that talking about? The rich and the famous. Those people out there. The people we aspire to be. The people we look up to. The people that are way up there. The highborn. It's a lie. The Bible's saying that's, there's, there's a lie there. You think they're highborn. They think they're highborn. But that's, that, that whole thing is a lie. The people that we think have no problems actually have more problems. The people that have more money actually have more issues in their life than we think they do because the highborn those people that we look up to it's but a lie the bible says that 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 whole lifestyle is a lie if we don't have jesus we have even more problem the more the more we attain the more we get he says the lowborn but a breath and the highborn but a lie if weighted on a balance they are nothing together they are only a breath do not trust in exhortion or take pride in stolen goods though your riches increase do not set your heart on there. What just happened is that we just got shown two different things. But a breath is talking about time. And exhaustion is talking about money, wanting to attain more money. So let's talk about two culprits, two culprits of stress in our lives. The first, this is in your notes. You can write this in. The first culprit is time. 
time or the improper use of time, the improper management of our time. Uh, we have to get a grasp on how we use our time because you probably can't do everything that you are doing right now in your life. I'm just going to be honest with you today that there are things in your life that probably need to go bye-bye. <laughs> there are things that you've signed up for, things that you've agreed to, things that you're doing in your life that you just don't have time for all that. You don't have time for all that. And in the scripture, we just got shown that that is a main culprit for causing stress in our life is poor time, what I'm, like, what I'm trying to call time management and managing our time well. Let's read from the book of Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5 on this. A lot of fun words in this one. This is the inscription that was written. Now, remember that story. Maybe you don't, but there was a hand that came out like Adam's family. It was like, and it walked up, and it started drawing on the wall. It's pretty funny. I wasn't there. I don't know how it happened. I don't know what it looked like. I don't know if it was like a ghost hand or if it was an Adam's family hand, and he like told jokes with sign language. I don't know any of that, but there was writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Here's what those words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign, and brought it to an end. Tikal, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and giving to the Medes and the Persians. He said, that was, that was crazy, but I'm, I'm trying to tell you what that means. He was telling the king at that time, your days are numbered. We all, do we all know that our days are numbered? Here, our days are numbered. We don't have an unlimited amount. Our days are numbered. They're limited. Your life is out of balance. He also says that. The message also says that. Your life is out of balance, and it'll cost you something. Your days are numbered. Your life is out of balance, and it's going to cost you something. Let's get straight to an application about this. It's time to start managing our time well. It's called a schedule, everybody. Can I just be, like, really simple today? I'm telling you to schedule your life. Schedule your time. You only have a limited amount. Why do you think you can just get away with life and not plan out your day? And not plan out and say, you know, I only have, guess how much time we all have in the day? 24 hours. It's the same for everybody. We all have the same amount of time. But when we walk through life going, well, I'm just going to, whatever comes my way. It's just like money. Whatever you don't budget will disappear on you. Whatever you don't budget will disappear on you. It will just get taken. And your time is no different. When you don't schedule your life and look at your priorities and, and, and ask, is this schedule right? Am I putting my priorities in here? Are there are, are the right things on here? Are the, are the right priorities there? Are there too many things that are wrong in my time schedule? Now, when I was younger, uh, I know I, I am younger, but when I was even younger, I, in my, my policy in life was just slam a rock star and get it done. Okay, get a rock star, crack it open, pound it down, and go because you only live once, right? Wrong. Man, and we go back even further to when I was even younger. Well, that's not what today's message is all about. I'm just trying to tell that many of us can have that mindset where I'll just, I'll just push harder. I'll just try and create more time in the day. I'll just try and, and accomplish more or, or, or push more or, or fight more because you only live once, right? Well, that's wrong. I was burning out fast, and I'm talking about when I was when I was, you know, being a pastor. I was staying up late, and I was waking up early, and I was burning the candle at both ends, and I was burning out. And you know who was paying the price? Me and everyone around me. Not just my family either. Everybody around me was paying the price. And the same is, the same is true for you. It's not just pastors. It's not just leaders. It's not, we all have people watching us. We all have people who are, I don't care how young you are today. I don't care if you're a teenager in school. We all have people that look to us. We all have people that are watching and know that you go to church or whatever, or maybe they just look up to you. We all have people like that in their life, and they're watching saying, is that, is, is what I'm seeing, is, is that right? Are, are, you, are you leading me right? And that's the way I was living my life, and it was dead wrong. Don't be foolish like I was with, with time and energy, thinking that you never have to take breaks or rests. Here's what I'm trying to tell you today. Schedule rests into your life. If you're stressed out, it could very well be that you just have not scheduled rest into your life. Did you know that God commands it? Did you know that it is a commandment from the Lord to rest? In fact, it's one of the 10 commandments. 
I, I remember it like this because it's the fourth commandment and you scratch the back of your head and it says, remember the Sabbath. Why does it say remember the Sabbath? Because I think it's the one we forget the most. It's actually the only of the Ten Commandments that if, if I broke nine of the commandments, I would lose my job and go to jail. Ad- adultery, okay, um, murder, stealing. Like if I broke any of the commandments, all nine of them, I would lose my job and go to jail. But there's one commandment I could break where I'd probably get a raise and a promotion. Which one is that? Forgetting to rest. Work harder. Work harder. Everyone looks at you when you're working hard and says, oh, yeah, look at them. They're doing good. Yeah, let's give them a raise. Oh, yeah, let's put more on them. There's one commandment that you and I can break and and get clapped at from society, and that's breaking the Sabbath. But did you know, back in the day, when when the Old Testament was the only thing and Jesus didn't come with mercy, when people broke the Sabbath, there were serious repercussions, very serious. What I'm trying to tell you today is that God from the beginning of time, has instituted a one in seven principle. God works like that. You know, he's, he's into numbers, he's into percentages, and he's into fractions. He really is. And he's into one-seventh of your life should be a day of complete rest. One-seventh of your life should be, should be resting. I just, you know, I do the same thing myself, and on Saturdays is when I, is when I try and take a whole day of Sabbath. And you know what I do? I, I don't set an alarm that day. I'm a 5 a.m.er. I know, it's crazy. It's really weird. It's, it's new for me, and I wake up really early in the morning. But on Saturday, I say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to turn my alarm off, and I normally wake up naturally around 530. It's really sad. It's really sad. But you know what else I do? I go and, I go and get donuts. Man, and I do certain things to, to tell myself because we really have to try to do this. It actually, t- this is funny, it takes work to rest. You know that? We actually have to try a little harder than, than we think to actually make ourselves rest and say, no, I'm not going to take that appointment today. No, I'm not going to go and get that extra money today. No, I'm not going to take that extra shift today. No, I'm, uh, this is my day of rest. Because if you want to burn out and, and die of stress, by all means, by all means, work seven days a week. But I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart that, that God has given gifted us that. Now, another principle we know from the word of God is that God blesses that. He really does. That when we try and and do it on our own, when we try and work extra and work that seventh day, it it shows in the Bible the Israelites did the same thing. They tried to work that seventh day to get extra food and to get extra resources, and God actually cursed that resource. Worms would come out of it. Like, it was just food, for them, it wasn't like dollar bills, but that, that food would actually turn moldy and get maggots in it when they tried to do it on the Sabbath. When, when they, but if they honored the Sabbath on the sixth day of work, they would earn twice as much. They would find twice as much. So what I'm trying to tell you is God, God will honor you in this. That if you actually give yourself permission to take a day off, God is, God is going to honor that. He always has, and he always will. It's a principle. That's what principle is. It'll, it's, it'll always be true. It'll always be true. Make sure rest and relaxation is built into your schedule. Now, it may be Saturday. It may be Sunday. It may be Monday. Actually, Romans, R- Romans talks about how that some people do it on one day. Some people do it on another. But I'm not legalistic about it, Paul says. And so I'm like Elliot now is saying, well, I'm not going to be legalistic about it either. If the Apostle Paul said, I don't have to be legalistic about it, that's enough for me. So whatever day works for you, because some of you work on Saturday, some of you work on Sunday. But but remember this. If you are dealing with stress right now, it could be as simple as I just need to schedule some rest into my life. One out of seven days should be complete rest. And it's not for him. It's for you. It's not not just because, you know, I want to do what's right by him. You know, don't strike me. You know, don't get me. I want to... I want to honor all your rules. It's a good thing. You know, fear of the Lord is a good and healthy thing. We should all have it. But we need to know that even Jesus said that the, the Sabbath was not created for God. It was created for, for you. It was created for man. That's exactly what Jesus said. Sabbath was created for you so that you could experience rest and peace in Jesus. And dare I say a little bit of dependence? Because if I'm going to take that day off, that means I'm going to need to depend on him a little bit more, Right? Yeah, because I feel I'll face the same things that all you will. That one day, that's when that's when something comes up, right? And that's when 
you know, somebody's going to pressure me to want to do something and to want to, you know, work a little bit more. You know, there'll be temptations. Schedule it in, y'all. Just give, give it a shot. Give it a shot. If you believe in God, you believe in his word, then, I, then you're, you're bound to that. But if you're still thinking about this thing, you're still thinking about Jesus and wanting to get on board with that, I would, I would encourage you, try it. Man, try his ways. Taste and see the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's talk about culprit number two. This is in your notes. You can write this in. Culprit number two is money. Come on, I should have talked about that one first, huh? Man, stress causer numero uno is money. Money. Money is a huge factor in dealing with, in dealing with stress. Now, this is a big one in our lives and culture, but it's funny that we're really supposed to be treating money the same way we treat our time. If we see, but instead of calling it a schedule, we call it a budget. Can, can I even talk from the pulpit about budgeting? Man, I'm trying to help you with stress today, though. And I'm telling you, a budget can really, you know, a little bit of pain at first in, in, in getting your finances in order, can, can save you from a lifetime, a lifetime of stress. A lifetime of stress. Poorly managed money has a way of destroying lives. Destroying lives. It destroys marriages. It destroys ministries. Poorly managed money has the power to do that. It just does. So instead of calling it a schedule, we call it a budget, and the same questions apply. We need to ask ourselves, is it right? Is what I'm spending my money on right? And some of us could look at our bank account and say, dang, I didn't know I spent $150 on Starbucks this month. I think if a lot of us just looked at our bank account, we would realize things that we don't want to realize. <laughs> wow, I had no idea that I spent $200 this month eating out every day at work, you know, for lunch. Instead of packing a lunch, I've been eating out, and wow, I didn't know it cost that much. But if we just look, and we're honest with ourselves, that we had not been counting the cost. We had not been managing well what God has given us, because every good and perfect gift comes from God. So everything that we have, our time, our money, and all of the resources that we have, even our talents, it's all for us to manage well. The Bible talks a lot about this. It talks a lot about, now, Tiffany and I, <laughs> I want to get honest with you guys today. Mm, I don't know. I'm up here, the lights are on me, I feel a little hot now, but uh, I want to get honest with you because uh, what good would I be doing you if I wasn't on it? We have a lot of background in this area. Now, not to say that we, we got on board with, like, you know, giving to the church. We, Tiffany was a pastor uh, even right before we got married, so Tiffany was always on board with, like, good uh, principles like that, with, like, giving to the church, the tithe thing, and, and I was too. So that was always there, and we got married, and we, we tithed, and we were blessed. You know, our, our bills were always paid. We were always taken care of. I mean, we, we made a stupid little amount of money. <laughs> it was funny because, um, you know, we, we, were, we were newly wed, but we, were, we had no kids. So it was like we didn't have very many bills to pay, so thank God, because we only made, like, this much money, and we lived in a little 500-square-foot two-bedroom studio, and uh, if you know what I'm talking about, then you feel me that we just, we, we did what we could, what we had, but, but we, we never really thrived. We never did, we never did the things that we really wanted to do, like get ourselves ready for retirement, like um, being able to have like a, a nice savings account, be able to have like a little emergency fund. We, we never had that until, until we did Financial Peace University with Dave Ramsey, and we started looking at our budget and saying, okay, every time we get paid, like we, in ministry, as pastors, okay, we're leading a whole church together, and we had not figured this out for our own lives, but we had started figuring it out for the church because we knew the church would go under if we didn't do this. The church was in a position where we just, we needed to, we needed to get on track in a serious way, but we didn't connect the dots like, oh my gosh, we could do the same thing with our own lives, and, and we, were, we were experiencing all this breakthrough, like we, we were starting to get all of our stuff in order, we got completely 100% out of debt with the church, the church has zero, zero debt, and we have savings account, we have money put away for the future, and we did all that with the church, but we had never like, oh, maybe we can do this with our own lives, it wasn't until we did that with financial peace, that was like three years ago, wasn't it, honey? About three years ago, something like that, give or take, doesn't matter, what we, what we found was this, though, Whatever you manage well, you will end up with more of. 
It's absolutely true. And we did not get a raise at all. I don't think we haven't gotten a raise in years, and we don't need one. Why? Because we looked at our money, managed it, and it's like as soon as we managed it and budgeted it, we were like, dang, we got all this leftover money. Where did that come from? It was incredible to see. I'm inviting you to try this. When, when, when you can go home today and you can figure out pretty simply, like, this is how much money comes in. This is how much money per month comes in to my life. And I have this, it's like 24 hours in a day. How am I gonna, gonna use it? There's things like rent and mortgage and blah, 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 things we have to do. Once you, once you do that out and you start deciding where you want your money to go over it just going wherever it happens to go based on how you feel that day, you will be amazed that you didn't even need to ask your boss for a raise because you just ended up with one just because you created a budget. Man, it's just amazing. And we experienced that. We were able to increase our giving. We were able to uh, you know, uh, invest into a Roth IRA. We were able to do all kinds of things as like, you know, been married for like three years, four years. And we're like, man, this is, this is amazing. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for everybody here. Man, I don't know why they don't teach this stuff in school. Come on, somebody. I was missing out. It's like, couldn't have somebody have showed me this. But no, I had to pay $100, go to a financial peace class, and go through all that just to learn that, no, you should tell your money where to go, not let it lead you around by the bit. You know, it was just amazing. Listen to this in 1 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money itself, but the love of money and letting the money lead you instead of telling your money what to do. And the same goes for time. I'm telling you, these two things are almost completely replaceable. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, some people have actually left the church. Some people have actually left church, walked away from their faith over money issues. Man, that's, that's incredible to me. That is incredible to me that, that money issues could actually drive people away from the church and from faith. And, and we've heard, we hear about stuff like that happening. It's just crazy to me because we've had our eyes, we've been through it. We went through it the hard way, granted. And we had to figure this stuff out later in life a little bit. I would like to have known it earlier. But we, that's just what we went through. And that's what I want for every single person here. That I want you stress-free about your money. Like, no matter how little or how much, now we all think we have little. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way right now. You know, having, um, having what your neighbor has is always enough, but what you have is never enough, right? That's why, the, that's why Paul said to Timothy, no, godliness with contentment. If you learn to be content with what you have, because I've had very, very little, and I've lived with much, too. And I've been able to live in both circumstances, because it, when we get it in perspective, when we get it in perspective that, you know, I came into this world with nothing, and I'm not taking anything with me. And just 10 years ago, I was a drug addict, or 15 years ago, some amount of years, I was a drug I didn't have anything. What am I worried about? What, what am I worried about? Why am I trying to hang on to stuff when just a little while ago I didn't have anything at all? Why am I going to let this now compromise my faith? Why am I going to let this now compromise my relationship with the Lord? Why? Why would I do that? But I forget just like anybody else sometimes, and I need to be reminded, man, that my, my time, my money, my talent, all of that stuff, it all belongs to him. And I just want to manage well because when I manage well, I'll have more to spread around. It's going to be amazing. Having money and time isn't bad, obviously. I hope, that, I hope that's clear. You know, I'm not saying that if you have, you know, a lot of money or if you have extra time, I'm not saying that you need to fix that or do something different about that. But the mismanagement of these two things can really wreck your life and cause a lot of stress. Let's talk about the answer. Let's talk about finding rest. Jeremiah 6 says this. For the, what, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. In other words, all of us here today, we're, we're, all looking, we're all looking at a crossroads right now. 
And you can either decide right now to either keep on going down the road you've been going down, or you can decide to change your mind and go down a different road. And what does it go on to say? Ask for the ancient paths. Ask, ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. What are those ancient ways? How about the ways the Bible have been talking about for thousands of years? Those sound like ancient paths. And it's saying, look for those ancient paths. No, manage well what you've been given. Think about the parables of, of people being given certain amounts. The parable of the talents. The, parable, the, the different parables of people where they were given different amounts. And how they managed it resulted in greater ministry. Resulted in, in better leadership in their life. No, you stand at the crossroads, every single one of you right now, just because you're listening to the words of my mouth. You are now faced with a decision. Am I going to keep on going down the road I've been going on and just letting stuff happen? And, and really, it's for, your own, it's for your own good. It's for your own that you don't have to deal with the stress any longer. That's really what we're talking about. I don't want you to have to deal with that stress because it's going to come back and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Ask for those ancient paths. So let's, let's talk about this. Number one, to deal with our time first. Number one, write this in. Live with a sense of urgency and purpose, purpose and urgency. Write them in any order you want, don't matter. Purpose and urgency. Now, when you're dealing with your time and when you're trying to schedule your time, I, newsflash from here, I, I, I schedule my time every week. I look at my schedule every single week. And it's like a living document of my schedule. And I, and I make sure, hey, am I doing all the things that I know I'm supposed to be doing? You know, am, am, I, am I spending enough time in my word? Am I spending enough time praying? Am I spending enough time with my family? And I have to look myself in the mirror. When I write it down, I look at it. Because if you don't write it down, you're just thinking about stuff. Oh, yeah, I think I need to spend more time with my family. You ever thought that in your head? Oh, I need to spend more time with my kids, I think. But have you ever sat down and wrote out, no, this is a, this is a good amount of time, and I'm going to do this amount of time. We have all been given a certain amount of time, 24 hours. How much of that are you going to spend with your family? It's, up, it's for you to decide. But I'm telling you, if you don't decide, that's a choice too. That's a choice to just let it happen, to just let it go. But what I do and what I'm inviting you to do is to schedule your time. Is to ske just take 30 minutes at the end of your week or the beginning of the week to say, you know what, these are my priorities. I have a purpose and I have urgency for these matters, and I'm going to write them in. I'm going to write them into my life. I want to spend time in my Bible. I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day in my Bible. You know what, I'm going to spend five minutes a day just sitting there praying. It may not sound like a lot, but it's more than most people do. Five minutes. And just write it in. And that has power to say, you know what, no, I'm, I'm scheduling myself. And I, and I, I schedule in really a lot of aspects of my life when it comes to the things I want to accomplish, the, the dreams I want to do, because it makes us look at what am I saying yes to, and then it forces us to say, what am I going to say no to, to allow room in my life to do the things that are really important to me. And that's the hard part, is that you're going to have to actually say no to some things in your life in order to say yes to better things. Is that making sense? Are you with me today? We have to say no to certain things in order to say yes to other things. Psalm 39 says this, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered. They're numbered. And that my life is fleeing away. Man, every time that we're just sitting here, the clock is ticking and we're losing time. And that can either stress you out or give you confidence to know I'm doing what I know I should be doing. And, I'm, and I'm, I've scheduled it. And even though things come up, I'm scheduling myself. And I'm, I'm living with purpose. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Human existence is but a breath. Matthew 13 says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. What is the field? The field is eternal things. When we focus on eternal things, that's what's worth selling everything for. And I'm willing to give up everything to, to get eternal things. I'm willing to give up my whole life in order to get eternal things. Number two, write this in. Put first things first. Put first things first. This goes for your time and it goes for your money. Matt, would you really pay your uh, uh, eating out bill before your rent? Of course you wouldn't. 
So why would we, why would we do that with, with other things that are important to us too? It's just crazy to me. Psalm 90, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Te- teach us how to spend them as we should. How should we spend them as we should? Matthew 6 says this, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Man, it's just an amazing thing that when we put first things first, it's amazing what comes after that. It's amazing that we've been struggling and fighting. It's just like those Israelites in the wilderness, man. When they put their own needs before what God said to do, man, they were, they were left wanting. But when they decided to put God first, when they decided to put his ways, his commandments first and say, you know, I'm going to start living God's way, it's amazing how he delivered them and, and supplied their every need. That's what, I, that's what I want all of us to walk away with today from the bottom of my heart from my own personal experience, but most importantly from the word of God for you today. Commit to putting first things first and watch God bust a move. It's like this. We have a little card in the back of all the things because we know, you know, um, tithing can be hard sometimes and putting first things first might have a lot to do with that. Malachi 3.10, you can read it for yourself. It's on the little card. But he says something in that verse that he doesn't say anywhere else in the whole Bible. He says, test me in this. God never says that about anything else in the whole Bible. I think that's really important because it's like one of the most crucial areas in our life. And God says, test me in this. Another way to say that is, watch me bust a move. You can take that to the bank. Let's put that in today's You can take it to the bank. When you put me first, all your needs are going to be met. They're going to be met. They are going to be met. And finally this, keep my heart set on heaven. Keep my heart set on heaven. Because this, this is where we get back to that first verse that we read. That on this earth, you'll have trouble. You will have stress on, on earth. And frankly, when we keep our heart set on heaven, it means lowering our expectations of earth. Lowering our expectations of what we're going to experience here on earth. Lowering our expectation of what the world has to offer. Seriously, because it's, it's a really American gospel to think that we're going to have everything that heaven has promised us here on earth. Like I'm not going to have any pain, and I'm not going to have any trouble, and I have all the things that I ever wanted in my whole, in my whole life. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus said. Nobody said that. <laughs> Nobody said that's made up. That's made up stuff. It's an American gospel that we think we should expect everything heaven has to offer in this life on earth. It's not true, and it's not right. And if we think that way, we will be stressed out trying to gain all the things that our mind wants. And that's what's causing a lot of stress in our life anyway. I went to uh, Mexico on a mission trip, and we went to an orphanage there. And we, we saw a lot of kids that didn't have families or homes. And I watched, kid, I watched kids gut laughing, playing with a flat soccer ball. Gut laughing. They were like, ha, 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 ha. They were like speaking Spanish and they were kicking the ball around and it was like, and it just stops right there. They were having a blast. And then I come home and there's kids with like 12 digital devices going, mom, I want one more. And we, hey, it ain't kids that just do that. It's, oh man, it's us. I'm going to speak to us men too right now. Man, it's all about that next toy. It's all about that next thing, man. I got to confess to you, I bought a new golf club this last week. I'm just saying, man, I was dealing with stress. It ain't bad to get stuff for yourself, but here's the thing. When I'm, when I'm, when I'm putting my hope in these, like, this is going to make me happy. These are things that all of us need to watch out for, myself included. Oh, this is going to make me feel better. You ever thought that? Maybe you didn't think it out loud, but somewhere back here, like, if we really assess if we really look at our lives and go, oh, wait, last month I spent like $300 on, you know, fill in the blank. Ooh, <laughs> I think I've been self-medicating. When I got a little, or I got an orphan in Mexico that is, he would just be content to have someone call him son. <laughs> but we're like, I need the newest iPhone. This one's garbage. I've had it for eight months now. It's total crap. Seriously, I'm being dead serious right now. This is how 
This is how we, I mean, look, at, I got it too, man. I got a little smartwatch right there. It tells me I'm working out on, I'm on the platform here. But if I let this, if I, if I let that pursuit of things get in front of my pursuit of God, oh, I'm going to be stressed out. No, I need to keep my eyes on heaven. I need to keep my, and I need to lower my expectations of what this earth is going to give me. You know, when I was getting saved at that Salvation Army in South Stockton, um, when, I, when I first gave my life to Jesus and I was, in a, I was in a recovery home with like 80, 90 other men that were all meth addicts like I was. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to freak anybody out, but that's just the reality of it. That's just where I came from. And they used to teach us this song. Well, they didn't teach us, but they sang it every single Wednesday. Every Wednesday night. It was an old-fashioned type of church with the, all the pastors and all the staff sat on the platform looking at you. Super awkward. Yeah, if you think it's awkward for one person to look at you with a microphone, try like 15. It yeah, crazy. But that's, that's where it was, you know. And they taught us this song, and they sang it every single Wednesday. I'll never forget this song for the rest of my life, it goes like this. <clears throat> Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. Come on. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. We did it honky-tonk version, though. We did. We did. It was a country church, man. Some glad morning. When I lie. Too far. Too far, Pastor. Too far. But you know, you know what that did to me, though? I sang that song for 12 months. 52 Wednesdays, I sang that song over and over and over and over again. You know what it did? It kept my eyes on heaven. That it's not this earth that's going to give me the pleasure that I need. That's a great thing to tell an addict. That this, that this life and everything that this world has to offer is never going to be able to give you all the things. No, I'm keeping my eyes on heaven. No, I'm keeping my eyes above. No, I'm looking at the things that are coming my way when I give my life to Jesus. No, when I die, hallelujah, by and by. There are things that you get right here and right now when you give your life to Jesus. You get a peace that surpasses understanding, and that's great. But when you think that everything that God has to offer is found right here on this earth, you're missing it. Man, that's how we can keep our eyes above the mess. That way when things go wrong in this life, which they will, you're not going, well, I must have messed it up. Well, I must have done something wrong. Well, God must have done something wrong. No, it's just the world being the world. It's just the world being the world. It's fallen. It's broken. It doesn't work. It's not our home. This place is not our home. But we keep our eyes on heaven. John 14 do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house. Jesus was answering a frequently asked question. How do I deal with stress? He says, in my Father's house. Son, daughter, I'm preparing a place for you where you're never going to have to deal with sickness ever again. And it ain't this world. There's a place waiting for you where you're not going to have to deal with those people problems anymore. There's a place waiting for you where you're not going to have to budget your money anymore. You're not going to have to schedule your time anymore. You're not going to have to deal with stress anymore. There's a place waiting for you, daughter. There's a place waiting for you, son. And it's going to be amazing. If God created the whole world in seven days, but Jesus has been preparing a place for the last 2,000 years, how good do you think it's going to be, really? It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. Oh, I can't wait for it. It's something that we've lost in this generation. Man, I, I'm, I know I'm a young guy. But I, I know for a fact they used to talk about Jesus coming back a lot more. They used, to come, they used to talk about, man, this world is not forever. And we're going to a place one day and it's going to be awesome. What does this mean about stress? Did you expect me to just like pray a prayer for you and you were never going to deal with stress again? I'm sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> I want you to know the truth. You expect me to pray? Oh, get ready, everybody. All your problems are going to go away. You're all about to feel better. No, when Jesus made this statement, he was making it very clear that Jesus offers more than a better now. 
Write this in and never forget it. Jesus offers more than a better now. He offers a better future. He offers a better future. The most important decision you will ever make is, am I putting my hope in Jesus who provides a better future, an eternal future? Or am I putting my hope in the things of this world which only offer stress? Am I giving all of my time to things that I think are dealing with my stress, like angry birds or whatever time-wasting thing I'm doing? Or am I prioritizing my time? Am I giving my money away to frivolous little things that I think are going to give me relief in the moment and make me feel a little better in life? Am I giving myself away to this world thinking that it's going to provide some kind of stress relief? Or am I putting my hope in heaven? Am I putting my hope in Jesus? My prayer for you today is that you would choose Jesus, prioritize the eternal over the temporal, and look to heaven for your peace and not this world. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Father, I just know that you're speaking to each one of us today. And Lord, I know you may even be speaking to a different issue in each one of us. Maybe it is about our time, how we deal with our time, that we've been giving our time away. We've been giving our time away to this world, and it's just not right. And some of us, we've been giving our money away. We have not been thinking about it properly, and we've been giving it away to this world, thinking it's going to provide us some kind of relief. And Lord, we've been let down. So, Lord, I just ask for every heart to be open today, every mind to be open today to the wisdom of your word and your Holy Spirit to speak to us about these issues and know, what do I need to go home and do today? What do I need to go home and change today? What do I need to go home and schedule today? I need to schedule that family time. I need to schedule that time with you, Lord, in prayer. I need to schedule that time in in. In, in prayer, in the word, or in worship even, or maybe some of us are thinking we need to go home today, and I need to prioritize my money. My money has been driving me nuts lately, and I can't stand it, and we know we need to go home today and say, you know what? I'm not going to let this control me anymore. I'm not going to let these things control me anymore. These things have been stressing me out to the max, and I'm not going to let it happen anymore. I just want to give one moment for the Holy Spirit to speak to you individually. I gave you some applications, but I believe the Holy Spirit may give you an application right now that I didn't think of. So open the ears of your heart right now with heads down, eyes closed. Holy Spirit, speak to us. What do we need to change? What do we need to do? What do we need to assess? What do we need to manage better? Lord, I know you don't want us to live stressed out lives. And the most stressful thing could possibly be weighing down on us is where am I going to spend my eternity? Where am I going to spend my eternity? But we're blessed because Jesus gave his life so that we never have to be in question about that ever again. God sent his one and only son so that whoever believes in him can have eternal life. That if we would just come to him and lift our heart and lift our hand and and lift our voice even to say, God, I give myself to you. But some of us here have not yet given our lives to Jesus, never have. But today is your day. Today is the day to take that step to say, Jesus, I'm all yours. You can have all of it. I tried to do it on my own, doesn't work. I'm giving my life to you. Some of us know that we're not where we should be with Jesus. We used to be really close, but somehow we drifted away and we're not where we should be. Our hearts have gone away. But today is your opportunity as well. Say, Jesus, I give my life back to you. So if I described you in any way, heads down, eyes closed, I would just ask that you would lift your hand. Go ahead, one, two, three. Lift it up high to say, I'm, Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. To say, God, I'm, I'm giving my life to you. I'm, I'm giving my heart to you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Let's pray this prayer together. And if you believe it, say it bold. Say it strong with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son. Jesus Christ to die on a cross for my sin 
I give you my life. I give you my mind. I give you my will. I give you my emotion. I give you my body. I give you everything. Holy Spirit, fill my heart. Fill me to overflowing. And change me. Show me the way to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate together everything that God has been doing in this place? Amen. Hallelujah.